Welcome to Monumental Questions, a panel designed to assess and revisit recent controversies over monuments and memorials. My name is Thomas Peace, and I'll be your host for today's conversation. Due to scheduling challenges, this session has been pre-recorded. If you're watching it live on Saturday, November 14th, 2020, please join myself and some of Western University's public history professors and students in the chat and afterwards to extend and continue the conversation we are about to have. Before we begin our conversation, I'd like to ask you to consider the place and relationships in which you are living. Upon whose land are you located? What people have called this place home? And relevant to our topic today, how have place names, monuments, and the buildings around you shaped these understandings? I'm speaking to you from the banks of the Deshkan Zivi, the Antler River, a place known today as London, Ontario a city that was built following the signing between Anishinaabe and British diplomats of the St. Anne's Island Treaty in 1796. As this place took on a new identity, British imperialists were building infrastructure to connect other imperial outposts to the forks of the Deshkan Zivi. A roadway, the first in this part of the world, connected this place to Lake Ontario, and it was named after Henry Dundas, a friend of the Lieutenant Governor, and who at that time, was the active agent in British Parliament delaying the abolition of the slave trade. That road, Dundas Street, continues to be the centre of our civic life today here in London. This place, however, means so much more. It has been, and is, home to Attawandaran, Anishinaabe, Muncie, Delaware, Oneida, and Haudenosaunee nations, among many other First Peoples who have come to find home in this city. It's also a long-standing site in the histories of slavery, freedom, oppression, and anti-racism. There are many important histories that have taken place here, and yet we might ask ourselves, how well are these histories remembered within the urban fabric of our city? Now, let us turn to the panel. Joining us today are Lisa Helps, who happened to grow up in London, and is a historian of housing, homelessness, and government policy, and the mayor of Victoria, British Columbia. Dr. Monica McDonald is a public history specialist and manager of research at the Canadian Museum of Immigration in Halifax. And Dr. Melanie Newton, associate professor of history at the University of Toronto, specializing in gender, slavery and emancipation and indigenous Caribbean history. Welcome everyone to the Words Festival. We're so glad that you could be with us today. Now we're about to embark on some contested terrain. The issue of monuments and the associated renaming of places and buildings has been a lightning rod for controversy in this country and around the globe. At one time or another, each of you have found yourself at the center of these civic debates. Now I'd like to start by going around the panel and asking you to situate yourselves within this broader frame. Dr. McDonald, let's begin with you. In addition to your work with the Canadian Museum of Immigration, you just finished co-chairing Halifax Regional Council's task force on the commemoration of Edward Cornwallis, the city's first imperial administrator and a man with a questionable and violent legacy. Your committee put forth 20 recommendations to council about how to handle his commemoration. Can you tell us a bit about the task force and how it decided uh, on, on a process to carry out its mandate? Well, first of all, thank you, Tom, for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, and I'm in uh, Halifax, or Chibuktuk, which is located in Mi'kmaq, which is the traditional and unceded lands of the Mi'kmaq people. So our committee was appointed in July of 2018. So this was about seven months after the Komala statue had been taken down, pending our deliberations and recommendations. So um, we were a 10-member committee, um, five members from the Mi'kmaq community whose names have been put forward from the uh, Nova Scotia Assembly of Mi'kmaq Chiefs, and five non-Mi'kmaq members uh, appointed by Halifax Regional Council. So I was one of the co-chairs. My other co-chair was Chief Brad Gugu um, of the Wake Above First Nation. And um, <clears throat> our mandate was to figure out what to do with the statue but also to um, decide or make a recommendation as to the renaming or possible renaming of Cornwallis Park, which uh, the statue, in which the statue was located, and uh, the possible renaming of Cornwallis Street, which is in another part of the city. 
And then the second part of our mandate was to make recommendations on the recognition and commemoration of indigenous history in the region. So um, <clears throat> we um, had a fantastic committee. Um, my co-chair and I, though, um, when we first met, we realized that we had to uh, change the governance structure and the foundation of our committee because we had been created as a committee of council to which Mi'kmaq members of the community were invited. We were funded by Halifax. We were answerable to Halifax City Council. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We didn't feel that was a good approach going forward. We felt it was still, we felt the intention was good um, and it was on the right path, but we felt that it was still a colonial approach, a top-down approach. Um, we felt that we should be more arm's length. We were fine with being answerable to city council, but we wanted to also be answerable to the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs. Um, and a committee of council is a very, um, it's under provincial legislation to operate with certain guidelines as to procedures. We felt that we wanted to, uh, and we needed to create our own procedures uh, for going forward. So in order to do all that, we had to go back to city council, table a new motion, have it passed, have the new administrative structure uh, signed off on, by both city council and uh, the assembly. So that took a few more months um, to, to get done. Uh, it was, was a bit frustrating because people had already been waiting and we were um, really eager to get to work. But you know, it's government, right? So that's how these things work. And we were happy to spend the time to just get it done right. Um, and we felt it was more, um, by doing that, we would adhere more closely to HRM's own statement of reconciliation, which they had passed in 2015. So we really wanted to be on the best footing forward in order to do our work. So once we got that done, we were off to the races. And uh, we started out by doing uh, a wide ranging um, research, um, historical research, but also research into other governmental reports like the one from Victoria, Lisa, and um, then the journalistic reporting, really from all over the world, concentrating mostly on North America, um, but also um, global examples from, from a, a number of different places um, internationally. Um, then we had a series of um, meetings. We met once a month for 16 months. We held uh, 16 or 16, six uh, public engagement meetings uh, and sessions um, for where it was an open mic type of situation all around the city. We held them and then in Millbrook um, First Nation. Um, and then two sessions where we led discussion circles. So we tried to uh, engage in different kinds of ways which would really um, have everybody uh, able and more, um, more at ease to participate. So um, we did that. We had a number of 80, uh, around 80 written submissions as well. Um, and then we, um, at the end, uh, 16 months later, um, we produced uh, around a 70 page report with 20 recommendations. So that's the basic process that we followed. Great, thanks, Dr. McDonald. So the controversy over Cornwallis and Mi'kma'ki in Nova Scotia may be one of the longer lived public debates over the legacy of historical figures. It really begins in the 1990s with uh, the activism of Mi'kmaq elder uh, Daniel Paul. But perhaps the loudest debate is the one that continues over the legacy of Canada's first prime minister, Sir Johnny MacDonald. Mayor Helps, in 2018, your municipal government chose to remove MacDonald from the doorsteps of City Hall. Can you walk us through the turn of events that brought about that decision? And to be a bit more specific, could you tell us a bit about the group known as the City Family? Sure, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm here this morning uh, in Victoria, BC, which is the, the homelands of the Lekwungen speaking people. Uh, they're known today as the Songhees and Esquimalt Nations, although those nation names were really a product of colonization. Uh, so the uh, Lekwungen speaking people um, have called this area home for, for thousands of years. And 
um, every every day uh, I'm grateful to them for uh, for welcoming those of us who are here um, as, as uninvited guests in many cases so generously and, and really that the story that I'm about to tell is a story of uh, immense generosity. So uh, a little bit like Monica said, um, we had initially thought that we would create a task force. So uh, let me go back. I was in um, Winnipeg in 2016 for the FCM conference and Mayor Bowman and his council had declared 2016 as a year of reconciliation. And I was curious and, and wanted to learn more about what that meant. And so I did some work with him to understand that. Uh, and then decided that in 2017, um, we would have well, what started out as a year of reconciliation, which is obviously going to take many decades. Uh, and, and so as part of that, much like Monica's process, we thought in our kind of colonial way that we would form a task force uh, to talk about reconciliation in the city of Victoria and what that means. What does it mean basically to be an uninvited guest on somebody else's homelands? And so we went to the nations uh, with whom we have a very good relationship. And we said, we'd like to take it, start a task force. And they, they basically laughed politely and said, well, that's interesting. Uh, but the, the, the Lekwungen mode of governing is, is through families. It's the family structure. So what you need to actually do is to create a family. And the mayor should be the head of the family and the family should be comprised of indigenous and non-indigenous members. Uh, and we, we didn't even, um, really, and I guess we kind of ran into trouble with this a little bit, but didn't even think to go back to council because we were really taking our marching orders from the nations on whose lands these are. So we kind of worked, you know, as soon as we were kind of kindly told, don't be colonial, we, we took that like all the way. So we created the city family, which is really uh, a body that reports to the Songhees and the Esquimalt nations, uh, their, their chief and council. And we began our work. Uh, we, we met uh, over dinner uh, in my office. We shared food. We met monthly. We didn't have meetings. We, we had family gatherings and we got to know each other as a family. And, and for non-Indigenous people, it's like, what? well, my family are the people that I was born with. But from an Indigenous perspective, as I've learned, families can be constructed families you know people are added to families and and anyway so that was that took a while to, to get our heads around as as non-indigenous people those of us on the family who are in the family who are non-indigenous and it became very clear very quickly that every time the indigenous family members had to come to the family gathering um they had to walk past sir john a mcdonald and I am completely, you know, was completely and probably still am a little bit mortified and embarrassed that I had an undergrad in history, an MA in history, and an almost complete PhD in history, and I didn't really know McDonald's true legacy. And so that's where we started with, with learning that he was the architect of the residential school system, among many, many other uh, really awful uh, legacies. Uh, and so we spent a year uh, in very intimate conversation with the mem members of the family uh, who are Indigenous, learning about the pain that this caused, learning about the legacy of the residential school system in real ways, like on real people right here uh, in, in the song, he's in his farm. It's not, not, you know, in theory. And after a year of conversation, it became clear that in order to continue the work, to build the trust, to show that we really uh, do understand what decolonization looks like, uh, the, the city family decided to remove the statue. We went to the nations, we went to the chief and council with both Songhees and Esquimalt and shared uh, our decision. And, and I can talk about witnessing later, but we went through kind of a witnessing process, which is again, a Lepungan tradition. And then that was our decision. So <clears throat> we, we went to city council and basically told them what we decided, uh, which you know, didn't go over that well, uh, but but thankfully they voted anyway. They thought that they should have a vote and then they voted uh, eight to one to remove the statue. And within days of the vote, the statue was removed. And that was really important to the nations because they knew that there'd be an immense racist backlash, which there was, uh, and they wanted us to protect them um, in, in whatever ways we could. And speed was was part of that. So I guess I'll leave it there. There's certainly a lot more to say, but that's that's kind of the process that led to the statue's removal. We can talk about the aftermath uh, later on. 
Great. Yeah, near closer to the end of our conversation, we'll kind of circle back to this question about municipal politics, because I think this has been uh, one of the real centers of, of this discussion that really seems to be happening in uh, within the urban fabric. We're going to turn the tables a bit here, though, moving away from that municipal politics uh, side of things and focus uh, more on a specific historical figure whose namesake has deeply imprinted this city, London. Henry Dundas. Professor Newton, this summer you did the media rounds, uh, so to speak. It seemed like uh, you were in many places at once in, uh, in late June, July, and, and August as Toronto embraced a broader movement centered in Edinburgh to remove the public commemoration of Henry Dundas, for whom Dundas Street is named, and more to the point is credited, or perhaps discredited is the better term, for prolonging Britain's use for nearly two decades of enslaved workers across its empire. As a history professor, why did you feel it was important to enter into this discussion about Dundas? And secondly, what is the role of professional historians to play in these debates about commemoration? Okay, thank you so much for that question and to the, it's so fascinating to learn from the other panelists about their experiences. Um, okay, so to go back a little bit, um, try not to make this take too long. Um, so many years ago, um, for about a decade, I've been studying the Afro-Indigenous history of the Caribbean, particularly the Southeastern Caribbean, which is where I'm from. I'm from Barbados. So um, this is the zone of the Caribbean stretching from St. Kitts to in the north to Tobago in the south that was the ancestral home of people whom Europeans refer to as the Caribbean. Indians, quote unquote, in the early colonial period, who were in fact a range of indigenous people, um, interconnected societies, but not, not necessarily the same people. Anyhow, I won't give you a history lesson about that part of the world, but I started doing that history and it really centers um, on this moment in the late 18th century when the British um, engaged in this incredibly violent and genocidal war in the island of St. Vincent, which is in this territory which was the home of an Afro-Indigenous people who were the descendants of fugitives from the transatlantic slave trade and the descendants of Indigenous people of this part of the Caribbean and who had managed to eke out um, to sort of preserve um, control over, over this island in the face of the expansion of slavery elsewhere um, in that part of the Caribbean. And the British, after the Seven Years' War, really earmarked this island as the next sort of big horizon for the expansion of sugar and slavery and launched this war that was this incredibly, even by the standards of the time, really quite shocking and violent um, genocidal um, action. And they actually exiled a large number of people to Central America. Um, so these are the Griffin of people and they're in St. Vincent and across Central America. So I was researching this period and this history and looking at the policies towards um, about the sort of conquest of this island um, and the violence of this period. This is the French Revolutionary War is trying to contextualize what the British did to the Griffin. They also exiled the Maroons, um, from, uh, Maroons from Jamaica. They suppressed all of these um, anti-slavery rebellions across the region in the 1790s. So I was doing that research. And then in the summer, I got, um, a call from a journalist or a journalist was referred to me um, to say, well, she might know someone about something about Henry Dundas. And I thought, oh, I'm not sure I really do, you know, like, cause I hadn't really been focused on him. And then as I prepared for this, for this interview, cause I knew who he was, but I hadn't really paid that much attention to his, his timeline in government. And I realized that the person behind all of the policies that I was studying was in fact him. <laughs> so suddenly it became very relevant. Um, so, because I'm working on the history of genocide, but I was more focused on the impacts and less focused on, on him. So then I realized, oh, actually I am a Dundas expert, you know, by accident, but, um, and I, I, was, I was quite stunned looking at the debate, including the debate um, in Edinburgh, that it really didn't talk about actually these policies in the Caribbean. It focused on these debates in parliament between the most elite men in the empire. Um, and I said, actually, you know, you, you can't really understand this debate or what makes Dundas such a problematic figure if you don't understand these actual policies in the Caribbean. So that's, that's how I entered the debate to really, um, to say, you know, you can't talk about this history as though the only actors in it are these elite white men sitting in parliament, although that of course is very important. You can't understand abolitionism um, and the forces surrounding it only on those terms. And you can't understand what it was 
that was driving Dundas's policies. If you don't understand, you know, this, this really intense effort on the part of the government, British government in the 1790s to really expand, to defeat democracy. Like, let's be very clear. This is not just a battle against France. It's a battle against any kind of democratic transformation of the empire. Um, it's a battle against freedom. It's a battle against um, um, equality. It's, it's, an all, it's an authoritarian war. And so that's how I entered that, that debate in that mm -hmm. period to try and sort of really get people to understand what were the broader stakes here um, of Dundas's actions. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Newton. Now I'm going to take the moderator's pr uh, prerogative here and and move us uh, in a in a slightly different direction, briefly, uh, from where I had intended to go. Because Mayor Helps, you mentioned your training in history, and you mentioned how you're uh, kind of relearning about McDonald's. And uh, Professor Newton, you kind of opened opened up this door a little bit further by pointing out that the debate in Edinburgh was really focused on these elite white men and the parliamentary discussions rather than the reality and the implication of their policies in the Caribbean. Um, and I, I want to I call reference, so I won't get into the specifics because it, it, it is, uh, was disappointing to hear uh, the other side of an interview you did with a media organization in Toronto with a historian who talked about how nobody was uh, talking about abolition in, in the 17, uh, 1790s. I won't go into the specifics, but I do want to just take a moment because all three of you have tr uh, significant training in history and in public history. Uh, and I think I'd like to invite you to reflect a little bit on the discipline itself, because the way that history has been told and, and what professional historians know uh, and, and the ways in which they've been trained is part of this conversation, I think. Uh, it orients us to, uh, the, the historiography tends to orient us towards uh, those parliamentary discussions or towards an understanding of McDonald that isn't as complete. As, um, as as even the archival record would demonstrate, as we now know. But I, I'm wondering if you might reflect a little bit about on, on historiography, given that we all have this uh, background, kind of the training historians might have. Does anyone want to take that? I, just, I, I, I thought we had a good opportunity to maybe spend a few minutes just reflecting upon uh, the state of the historian's craft. Um, Does anyone? Actually, yeah, I guess, because we don't have a lot of time, I'm happy to, to take that. Um, so it's funny that you should say, so I was talking about Dundas, but actually the interesting thing about a figure like John A. Macdonald and about him specifically is, and I know this is going to be a very, this is a very controversial thing to say in Canada, which to me is interesting because it wouldn't be controversial in the Caribbean. I did learn quite a lot about him. I probably know a lot more from my, from the courses that I took in the history of the Caribbean during just one semester at the University of the West Indies in Barbados, um, I did read about Confederation in Canada. I read about it because it happened in the same decade in the 1860s, a generation after emancipation in the Caribbean, in which in order, so in that decade, in order to prevent um, a growing voting public of freed former enslaved people, and um, people who had been born in freedom, who were coming to voting age, who were acquiring in some parts of the Caribbean enough property to qualify from the, for the vote, who were even beginning to run for office in these colonial legislatures in the Caribbean. Um, so, the colon so several of the Caribbean's former slaveholding islands had had legislatures since the 17th and 18th centuries. So places like Barbados, Jamaica, Antigua. Um, and what they faced in the 1860s was the prospect, in fact, of an a black voting majority who was going to vote people, of course, who um, supported an abolition, like the, the a free agenda, as it were, into office. And so um, confederation is really part of the establishment of white supremacist government in the British Empire. It happens in the same decade where those assemblies were abolished, and they were abolished specifically everywhere in the British Caribbean where those assemblies were in danger of being effectively taken over by black voters, right? So they were not abolished in Barbados, which was had a very entrenched planter political supremacy system, um, Bermuda or the Bahamas. These are places where that white elite was very, very well entrenched in politics, but everywhere else, right? Um, they also reformed the government of British India to remove large numbers of Indian um, um, civil servants from the British from the British 
administration in India. It's, it's a part of a long process across the late 19th century where you have a clear distinction between white settler government and the establishment of the, or the removal of any possibility of sort of widening non-white democracy elsewhere in the empire. And it is inseparable from, um, the, from, this, from the establishment of the residential school system and the Indian Act, because, because the whole idea was that these white settlers were establishing dominion, sort of the, the imperial government was devolving responsibility for the management of their indigenous populations onto these white settler governments. This was the point of responsible government, that these white settlers were going to now, you know, take on this responsibility, you know, the white man's burden before that was a term. Um, so that's the whole point in the way of confederation. That's its context. It is about the entrenchment of white supremacist government in the British Empire. So I learned that, but it's not taught here. I want to come back to that in a second. Just before we do, um, Dr. McDonald or Mayor Helps, do you want to uh, add anything uh, on this question about uh, the state of kind of how uh, history is remembered? Um, in our report, one of the key things we started out with was to remind people that there's a big difference between history and commemoration. So that is really the basis of our report. Um, so history is the evidence-based analysis um, to come to an understanding of the past, putting things in context, looking at different perspectives. Um, and commemoration is how people today choose to mark or commemorate aspects of that past. So it's a basic thing, but it's key for people to think about who may not be historians or don't have a historical background to realize that there's a big difference there. Yeah, yeah. and I'll just build on that. Um, <clears throat> one of the city family members is a man named Kerry Newman. Uh, he's he's indigenous and he is uh, created this fantastic documentary and, and um, fabric called the witness blanket. And if anyone hasn't heard of it, uh, it's really worth looking into. So basically he gathered up artifacts uh, from the resident, like actual physical artifacts from the residential school survivors and, and made essentially a, a blanket out of them. And he's, he's since made a documentary about that. But recently at our family gathering, as we were talking about what are the next steps for the statue, he said what the statue, the, the conversation about the Sir Johnny MacDonald statue in Victoria should be about the history of the 1980s, right? What that's when the statue was erected. So what does that tell us about the history of Canada at that point? So just building on the comment about the difference between history and, and commemoration, at some point in the 1980s, this Sir John A. Macdonald Historical Society, or I forget what their exact name is, formed. They came to the mayor. They said, do you want a statue? The mayor said yes. And so that's the history of the statue itself, which is separate from the actual history of the, the, you know, John A. McDonald's actions, which we all also need to know more about. So I think that's an important distinction. I, th I do think that this, that distinction is important. Um, but I also want to come back to where you left us, uh, Professor Newton, uh, and get us thinking a little bit more broadly about, about, about this issue. Because up until now, we've talked about three specific controversies, if you will, around three specific individuals and how they're commemorated. But we could, of course, also be talking about countering Colston in uh, Bristol, England. We could be talking about Robert E. Lee in Charlottesville, Virginia. And of course, more globally, we could be talking about the Roads Must Fall movement. Professor Newton, you're a professor here in Canada, but you've trained at Oxford in the UK and uh, you study and are from the Caribbean. Can you bring all this together? Because it seems fairly clear that each of these movements aren't isolated uh, forms of political action, but indicative of a broader culture of malaise linking them together. And just to build off of what Mayor Help said, there is, um, it, it does seem to me that there is a relationship between the history that you just set out in terms of the development of white supremacist government uh, within uh, at least the British, uh, the legacy, um, uh, nation states of the British Empire, uh, and these these processes of commemoration and then resistance to them. So I'm wondering if you could help us understand, you know, how are these individual movements tied together? Or are they? I mean, I, I'm making an assumption, I suppose, but <laughs> uh, I'm hoping you could help us understand this context. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think a real answer to that question would take much longer, but I think absolutely they are tied together. And I'd say it's not so much that they are about malaise. They are, they really live in that space between 
what democracy promises and what it delivers. And the fact that um, these kinds of monuments and street names um, are, the, are indications of this interconnected history that these, these systems, the way that um, white supremacy as a transnational force really entrenched itself um, in the era of democracy, like that it is, it's this constant um, millstone in a way around sort of meaningful, um, tr the transformation of institutions of democracy into fully the experience of democracy in the 20th and, and, and 21st centuries. And so I think these movements really spoke to the fact that, um, that people had, had long understood this about these monuments, that they were there to publicly um, sort of celebrate in a sense that distinction. They, they served as a kind of um, comfort in a way to, um, to elites, if you want to call it that, um, that even as society changes, it's more diverse, you know, there are more and more people involved in the democratic process, but at the end of the day, the, um, the assumption about, um, certain kinds of assumptions about the actual appropriateness of inequality are not going to change. They, they, they constantly um, assert the legitimacy of this, of this white supremacist heritage. So I think there'd long been a, been a sense of anger about these statues, but I think what you see now is, and particularly I think, in the wake of all that happened this summer and the revelations over the last, I mean, we have to remember this is the Roads Must Fall movement, the movement against Confederate statues, that really um, has been picking up for the last several years, along with the movement against John A. MacDonald. And I think there's really a sort of enough is enough feeling. And what people are articulating is not with these statues, it's actually a different, a sense of a desire for a different kind of relationship with their government. Um, and I think in some ways you've seen some of the potential of that, for example, in the US elections to the south of us and the massive turnout for that election because these issues were so much at the center. I think we've seen you know, that real hunger for um, that actual promise in many ways of, of democracy. So I think these monuments are symbolic, but they are more than that. And I think it's fascinating listening to, the, to what um, the other two panelists have said, when you just start to just ask, you know, what is this statue doing here? What does this street name mean? What else opens up about the society, about the land on which we live, how we relate to it, relations between people? They really are, um, this actually quite fragile front line that is meant to block those kinds of conversations. And the minute you go after them or challenge them, these other possibilities open up. So I think that's why people are going after them because they want those conversations to happen. Thank you. I mean, you set up both the next question I wanted to ask uh, Dr. McDonald, but you also uh, set up uh, the question I want to ask uh, Mayor Helps just after that with that different relationship to government. Uh, and so I, I want to just kind of plant that seed that we'll, we'll go there in a few moments. But before we go there, uh, we've talked a lot about the political context of this, but I want to turn a little bit to the bricks and mortar, uh, so to speak, of monuments themselves. Uh, Dr. McDonald, you coordinate research at one of Canada's flagship national museums. You're also the author of a recent book on how television, the CBC specifically, has shaped Canada's national historical consciousness. Um, and I'm wondering whether you see a difference in how people relate to monuments and place names relative to your work in the museum or how history is portrayed on TV. So to put that another way, would this issue be as politicized if your museum or the CBC mounted a project that put Cornwallis's legacy into question? Or is, and I think Professor Newton, you've, you've alluded to this already, is there something specific to this debate about re-envisioning public spaces and monuments that we need to understand? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really good question. I think um, it definitely has, uh, for example, if you were to do a museum exhibit on the legacy of Cornwallis or a history documentary on television about the same thing. It definitely has the potential to be as contentious. Um, and we've certainly seen that in the past, uh, for example, on, on other topics. So for example, the Allied uh, bombing of Germany during the Second World War, um, at an exhibit on that topic at the War Museum is very contentious. Um, on the same topic, uh, a history documentary 
um, in the 90s on, on the CBC, again, um, very contentious. So um, it definitely has the same potential. However, in museum exhibits and on television, you have a lot more room for context and explanation and showing different perspectives. Um, doesn't mean it, it can't go sideways like I just explained. Um, but there's a little bit more room there to, to, to get it right, I guess. Um, I would say that, um, well, in our own report, um, one of our recommendations was for a civic museum to be created. Um, another recommendation, a key one, of course, was that once that museum is created, that the statue of Edward Carmelis be removed to that museum and be made part of the collection. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it go on display because for any museum, less than 5% perhaps of its collection ever goes on display. But if such a thing were to be done, it would have to be done very carefully. And of course, in um, sharing authority of that exhibit with the Mi'kmaq community. I was very intrigued to read about um, the plans for the Edward Colston statue. So this is a statue, of, um, we all know it, that was um, in the news during the Black Lives Matter um, protest in the summer. It was toppled in um, Bristol, toppled into the harbor. Um, he was an enslaver. Um, protests uh, around that statue had been going on for many years. It was not uh, a one-off uh, new thing, um, but it came to its culmination in toppling it into the harbor. Um, so city officials fished it out a few days later. It was damaged, there was red paint on it, but they cleaned it up a little bit. And their plans um, apparently are to um, display it in the Museum for the City of Bristol damaged with the red paint on it among the uh, placards of the Black Lives Matter protests and the protesters and including some of the hate mail that the black mayor of the city of Bristol received when the statue was thrown in the harbor. So I thought that was very intriguing because it really subverted the original intent of the, of the statue in the first place. Um, and it's something quite different for museums to be doing. And I, and I hope that's the path that, that we'll be taking from now on. So um, I think there's definitely ways that, um, that such exhibits could take place and really tell people, as Mayor Felt said, um, talk more about the legacy of the time that these statues were erected rather than the history of a Colston or the history of of uh, uh, Edward Cornwallis, you know, we have enough of that. Um, what's really interesting is this moment right now. Mm. Well, thank you, Dr. McDonald. I, I, I think we're gonna have enough time. I'm gonna circle back uh, just after I, we go to uh, Mayor Helps. So and just, uh, I just wanna plant the seed beforehand and ask you about uh, memorials um, and, and acts of commemoration that work well. I think you pointed to a good one in terms of Cornwallis. Uh, Professor Newton, you've talked uh, about uh, commemoration of Martinique uh, in some interesting ways. Um, but, uh, but I think we'll have some time to kind of come back to that. But before we do, uh, Mayor Helps, I want to bring these two threads together, pick up on, on uh, what Professor Newton was saying about the different relationships to government and swing back to your city council chamber because um, we spoke earlier about the removal of McDonald's statue. But that, of course, must have been one of many heritage related choices your city council uh, would have had to make in, uh, uh, in 2018. And so what are the policies and core principles that determine how the past is commemorated in your city? Or perhaps to reframe this a bit, how have these debates about public space, history and heritage effect, affected local government and perhaps the broader political climate in Canada in your assessment? It's a really good question. Um, Victoria has a very long-standing heritage program um, to ensure that the, the buildings that were built in the late 19th and early 20th century are preserved. And that's been, you know, it's like an award-winning program. And it, it means that in the core of our downtown, we, we don't have skyscrapers. We have the harbor and then these, you know, beautiful older buildings rising up. And so that, you know, until we began the Witness Reconciliation Program, which is the, the our reconciliation program 
and the city family is part of that. Uh, but when we began the witness reconciliation program in the summer of 2017 and formed the city family, the very the very purpose, um, in addition to understanding, you know, the the trauma of literally moving into somebody's living room building a city and, and never leaving. So there's there's the emotional work that needs to be done between the city and the nations and between citizens and the nations. So that's part of it. But in terms of um, you know, the, the other very deliberate approach that we're taking to reconciliation is kind of the, the uh, I won't call it the opposite of heritage, but but making Indigenous language, culture, lives, presence felt throughout our community. Uh, so, so that's the really interesting, not only conversation we've been having since 2017, but some of the actions we've been taking. And, and just to, to give you, you know, an illustration, uh, and this was such a moving moment. It's such a small thing, but it was, it was very moving for me. Um, we had uh, the, uh, actually, uh, you know, and interestingly and coincidentally, I suppose the mayor who erected the Johnny McDonald statue, Peter Pollan, was in many ways, you know, he, he saved Victoria from becoming just like every other city. He was was against high rises so he he created green spaces so it really like interesting man anyways he he passed away a couple of years ago and so we actually um dedicated a park uh in his name but not without also calling it Jamathit. And the, the Laquanian name comes before Peter Pollan. So it's Jamathit Peter Pollan Waterfront Park. And we had a dedication ceremony uh, at which a young Songhees woman, Brianna Bear, who's absolutely brilliant, spoke about the meaning of the land. And then the Pollan family spoke. And, and it was just really moving to see, again, Laquanian language, culture, stories built alongside what the future of Victoria looks like. And the moving moment for me was that we're in budget right now and uh, the Lekwungen names for some of our parks that have been given to us by the Lekwungen people are there in Lekwungen phonetics. So not just the, the anglicized spelling, but Lekwungen phonetics. And, and when our director of parks was presenting his budget to council, he began, he said, Jamathit. Peter Pollan Waterfront Park, and to hear our, our staff speaking Lekwungen from the, the teachings that they've received from working really hard with the Lekwungen elders about these names is absolutely moving. And so it's not really about commemoration or heritage, it's about the, the, the visibility of Lekwungen language, culture, stories, people in their own homelands, which also happen to be the city. It strikes me if I can follow up just briefly with that, that uh, if I'm hearing you right, this issue of commemoration is really following this far broader and more important process of witness reconciliation in Victoria. Um, and if that's the case, could you give us a sense, how unique is this uh, in terms of municipal governance um, in Canada? Is, is Victoria, are other cities doing similar doing uh, taking a similar approach in it. i i don't know and you know i think what uh, what's most important and and other other cities are definitely working on reconciliation obviously but i think it's probably different it it, it should be different everywhere in canada if we're doing it in an indigenous led and indigenous informed way because each indigenous nation across canada has their own cultures their own practices their own stories their own relationship with the land their own relationship with the ancestors and so i would i would hope that it's unique everywhere across the country um i you know our our relationship or our approach rather has been to to really be indigenous led and indigenous informed um, we're there doing the work, like, you know, Chief Andy Thomas, the uh, former Esquimalt chief who, who died a few years ago, he said, this is your work. Like, we're here to help you, but this reconciliation stuff, this is your work, you do it. Um, so we're doing it in an Indigenous informed way. So I, I don't know, my hope is that each, each municipal government across Canada would go and work with the nations on whose lands their city is on, and, and so therefore it should be unique in every place. Thanks a lot. Now, I, I asked Mayor helps the follow-up question now. I've, I've run out of time to for good examples of monuments because I did that, so I apologize uh, for that. But um, uh, viewers who are interested, I think um, Dr. McDonald and Professor uh, Newton have, um, have discussed this in other forums, which we can point to uh, online in the chat. Um, and, uh, and, and we can address that question in that way. But to end, uh, let's move from the political, bureaucratic, and academic side of things to the place of the public. 
These debates uh, tend to be polarizing. Sometimes the discussion is a little simplistic. Uh, here in London, because of the advocacy of a 10-year-old, Lila Wheeler, our Civic Works Committee is revisiting our bylaws and policies related to street uh, naming. The specific street in question is known as Plantation Road, and the policy revision is the result of significant costs incurred by those seeking to make the change. And I've been shocked by both the public's response in critique of these efforts, uh, but also by its its volume. There's been significant. This is generate for for uh, um, a, a relatively small change, a, a street name change generated by a, a, a ten year old. I, 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 for me, this is a political no brainer, and yet it's 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 brought out all sorts of uh, of critique, and people have strong uh, opinions uh, that sometimes seem like they're they're perhaps not as well thought out as, as they could be. And so I'm wondering if we might end by asking the three of you who have deeply engaged with these ideas to offer a piece of advice for people uh, to think about as they think about the politics of commemoration, about monuments uh, and place names. What's one uh, thing or resource that people can go to to, to help them um, better address this uh, subject? Uh, Professor Newton, do you want to begin? Um, yeah, I think I would say, um, first of all, that to Lila Wheeler, if she ever sees this, I hope I see her someday in one of my history classes at U of T, and good for her. That's really, that's incredible. That's amazing. Um, so I want to give her that shout out. Um, I would say that I do, I think that the lack of reflection that this kind of the, the entrenchment of um, the sort of this, this public monumentalization of masculinity, of whiteness. You know, we look at, I was asking you earlier, are there any street names to women who, are, who were or are not current British queens in London? And you're struggling to come up with some names and it's a bit similar here in Toronto. Um, that these were very specific decisions taken at a time to reflect certain kinds of values. Um, and they are, they are, they are hard to overturn, but it is part of the necessary work of ensuring that democratic systems are vibrant and responsive. So I would say, um, I think you were mentioning that there are particularly a lot of sort of older people who have reacted quite negatively to Lila Wheeler's campaign. And I would say that the ways in which um, we've all been taught to hold up these very narrow understandings of leadership um, and to see, not, not to be critical of our forms of public architecture, urban planning, um, what we're taught in class. So, you know, we're, they, this is sort of lack of, of criticism that we've been, we've been taught. Um, it's, it stunts the imagination. And we live in a moment where we need imagination to think ourselves, to imagine what kind of different future and we all hopefully come out of lockdown and are facing, have to face up to our environmental catastrophe. That is the legacy of this system of colonialism. That is, that is its root, right? Um, and we have to face that. It's an existential connection between the past and the present that we have to face on this planet. So I would encourage people not to feel so defensive and in fact, to see the possibility of a different and better world in these struggles. Um, and that, that is, that's a good thing. Um, so I understand that emotive connection because that is a learned reaction that as soon as you see these things being challenged, um, you're taught to identify with them and you must be defensive, but that is never the right reaction to your own children. Like it's just, it's just not right. And so I would say there, this is hopeful, in fact, right? Hopeful it's, it's that for our future. A hopeful mm -hmm. magic future. I love that. I, 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 I love that phrase. Thanks, Professor Newton. Dr. McDonald? Well, I'm not sure I can be that eloquent. I'm, I'm sorry to be going after you. <laughs> um, but again, I think I would uh, point out the difference between history and commemoration that we've already discussed. Um, and, you know, when we were deliberating and, and working and trying to make our recommendations, and we heard a lot from the public, we heard a lot in the media 
um, there was a lot of contention. And one of the things we heard a lot was that, you know, somehow we were erasing history by taking the statue down or, you know, it would apply to changing the name of the street, of the street or, um, or, other, or other ways of changing how we uh, commemorate the past. Um, but, you know, a statue is not history and nobody learns anything, any history from a statue. But what I think people need to understand is that there is such a thing as erasing history, but it's typically not the history of a John A. Macdonald or an Edward Cornwallis or a Dundas or some of these other uh, men, you know, and they're all men. Um, these folks are well ensconced in the historical record. So they're not going anywhere and nor should they. They're there in history. We have their um, we have their archival correspondence, there's contemporary paintings or photographs made of them. They're there and they always will be. But the people whose history has been erased are women, are black people, are people of color, are um, are indigenous people marginalized people, these are the groups um, who have no street names after them, who have no statues to represent them. Um, these are the groups that we, who need to have their fair share now. And that's why there is this reckoning of history. And it's a good thing. Great, thanks a lot, Dr. McDonald. And Mayor Helps. Uh, what would you say to uh, to the public? I suppose you do say. <laughs> so just this this notion of erasing history. I just want to talk about that for a moment because you know that of course we got the same thing. You're erasing history for you know weeks after Johnny McDonald, and and my response was we have not had such a public conversation about Johnny McDonald in the nation for a long time. It's like the opposite of erasing history, removing the, it's like all about John A. McDonald. So that was interesting. But in terms of what to do and how to bridge some of the polarization, uh, what we did here, and you can put it in your in your Facebook chat uh, when, when this goes live, is we created the Victoria Reconciliation Dialogues. Uh, and it is and has been so powerful. Um, again, it wasn't all about the statue. We had planned six sessions. The last two got canceled because of COVID. And it was to bring people together. And they're, oh, the, the reason that people can go in and watch them. And again, they're Indigenous-led, Indigenous-informed. There, there are witnesses who are called at the end. And we, we thought that we would have, you know, 60 or 70 people. We did the first one on Orange Shirt Day, September 30th, uh, 2019. We did it at City Hall. And our fire chief was freaking out because the capacity was you know, it was, there's so many people here. And so then we had to move it to the conference center. And again, it's, it's to grapple with, um, that we began with elders and the land. So the first session was, you know, the, the elders telling us about what us, the, the large us, what, 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 what are these lands for? What are the stories of these lands? And then we moved to um, Indigenous uh, people and, and newcomers. You know, what do newcomers to Canada know and learn? Anyways, fascinating series. And, and, and it's, you know, we, we had 400 people attend in person, uh, the same number online. They're there uh, for, for people to watch and, and continue to learn from. And the last one before the uh, COVID hit, we had uh, Cindy Blackstock as an honored guest to come and be one of our, um, our speakers. And she was honored with a blank by the chief of the song he's and then she wrote a book uh about it she wrote this book and so we see you know it's a kid's book and then here i'm not gonna but there's the there's city hall and there's the statue being carried away and so um and and so out of these these dialogues which have been very difficult very painful and 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 but it, it's it takes the, the polarization right out of it if we sit down for three hours over an evening and, and actually listen and learn. And it's been it's been brilliant. And we're going to get them going again, um, either post COVID or we, we didn't we didn't know whether we could do this kind of thing online. But but the, the indigenous members of the family say that we actually can and they've got some creative ideas. So we may yeah, have a few more to do uh, in uh, in the new year. Well, thank you. And on that note, our time has come to an end. This conversation has been so much broader than I expected. I mean, we've hit up both commemoration in history and, uh, and municipal politics, but I think we've gotten to a level 
who I, I did not anticipate a children's book coming into this conversation. <laughs> and yet here we are. And I think this gets at uh, why this issue is, is so important because it does get to the identity of our communities, our own identities, and, uh, and, and why it resonates and why it is such a complicated subject for uh, many people to engage with. So on behalf of the organizers of the Words Festival, I'd like to thank each of our panelists for being with us today. Thank you, Dr. McDonald, Professor Newton, and Mayor Helps. And uh, I'd like to remind our viewers that Words Fest continues for another week. For more programming, visit the website at www.wordfest.ca. And to you, our viewers, uh, thank you for watching and participating in the chat and have a great rest of the day.